Hey everyone, welcome to another John video um, for the Red Youth Baptist Church Youth. And we're going to start with John 14 today, um, 1 to verse 14. So I'm going to play a video first, uh, just to kind of put it in perspective, um, give you a bit of like a visual to guide us through 1 to 14. So enjoy that one and I'll be right back. I'm telling you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will say three times that you do not know me. Do not be worried and upset. Believe in God, and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself, so that you will be where I am. You know the way that leads to the place where I am going. Lord. We do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way to get there? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. Now that you have known me, you will know my Father also. And from now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Lord. Show us the Father. That is all we need. For a long time I have been with you all. Yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe, Philip, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you do not come from me. The Father who remains in me does his own work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If not, believe because of the things I do. I am telling you the truth. Those who believe in me will do what I do. Yes, they will do even greater things. Because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask for in my name so that the Father's glory will be shown through the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. So yeah, this is really one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's amazing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What an amazing, amazing statement. And we're gonna kind of d dissect uh, the rest of that as well. So we're going to start with the first section, which is verses 1 to 4. So this is Jesus kind of assuring a future reunion in heaven. So Jesus is talking to Peter and his disciples here. This is such an encouraging and amazing hope. Um, he's telling us, or sorry, telling them that yes, he will be leaving, but he will be back. And whether that's in their lifetime or not, there will still be a reunion. And that's the amazing truth that he's revealing to his disciples here. And this applies to us as well. It's not just the disciples. Jesus may come back in our lifetimes as well. I mean, what an amazing thing that would be to see Jesus meeting him in the air, to see him there face to face in our lifetime. And it could happen. We might uh, die before he does. But regardless, we will still meet him again and live in his house forever. That's what it says here. No, what can be a better hope? We're going to meet Peter, we're going to meet Thomas, we're going to meet all the disciples, but most importantly, Jesus will be there. And that is really the goal, isn't it? That is the hope that we uh, put our hope in, in this life, because this life is so short and eternity is so long. Um, I mean, it's we're going to suffer down here, but what an amazing hope we've got. But notice in first one, it says, let not your hearts be troubled. That's what my version says. He's basically saying here, don't be worried. Don't let yourself be worried. And I thought it was interesting because, you know, do you feel like sometimes there is no way to stop yourself worrying? As I do. Um, it, but it seems clear here that Jesus is actively telling them not to worry, to make themselves not worry, to make themselves not worried because they have faith. And we need to be like that as well. Our faith means that there is actually no room for worry. And if we do start worrying, Jesus gives us the power to actually just stop it. And it seems a bit weird to us because if someone came up to me and said, stop worrying, I'd be like, well, 
I can't, you know, it's, it's, I'm worrying, you know, I'm, I'm not just going to like actively make myself stop. But that's what Jesus is saying. He says that we actually have the power through faith to say, no, stop worrying. And it's, it's an amazing power because I don't think non-Christians have that. And, and faith is what makes us actually not worry because we, he's just preparing us for a future in heaven with him. He also says, I go to prepare a place for you as well. And that's amazing. And you only prepare a place for someone if you're confident in their arrival, which I thought was amazing. So Jesus could only say this uh, to the group after Judas had left, because obviously Judas wasn't a Christian. He wasn't following God. He wasn't following Jesus. So when Judas left, he says, right, I'm going to prepare a place for you guys. And he would not go to pre prepare a place for Judas. And there's a very really interesting quote I picked up here. As he is preparing the place for us, he is preparing us for the place. I think that's profound. So it's, it's kind of like getting our room ready, you know, with like special beds and showers and stuff. And whilst that's happening on earth, he's giving us the capacity to be able to enjoy it and live there as a as a prince, as a son of God, as someone that's like Christ. And um, it's amazing that right now, as I'm talking and as you're listening to this, he is preparing that place. This life is so short, like I said, and he's he's getting it all ready for us when we enter um, into heaven with him. That's just I mean, what could be a better hope than that? So that's what he's kind of telling the disciples about. So verses five to six now. So just these two verses. And this is one of the best. I mean, this is such an incredible verse. You know, we can remember this verse when people tell us that there are many ways to heaven because a lot of people do that. And that, that is wrong because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. So when someone says, you know, there are many roads to heaven, we can actually say, well, actually there isn't. Christianity is totally exclusive. Jesus says that no one can go to heaven unless they come through Jesus. So someone from another faith might just say, that's fine, you've got Christianity, you've got Jesus. Yeah, I, I like Jesus too. You know, there's loads of different ways to heaven. Totally wrong. You have to put your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone in order to go to heaven and be right with God. Let's break it down a bit. If Jesus is not, let's say, not the only way to God, then he is not any way to God. Because if there are many roads to God, then Jesus is not one of them. Because he absolutely claimed there was only one road, and he himself was that road. If Jesus is not the only way to God, then he was not actually honest, because he said, I'm the only way. And if, if that's wrong, then he was a liar, and he was most certainly not a true prophet. He then would either be a madman or a lying devil. You know, there is no middle ground available for us. He's either truth or a lie. And if he's the truth, that means he's the only way, because that's what he said. Um, so let's break down way, truth and life, because it's such an important verse. So why is Jesus the only way? We've kind of covered that, but we'll say because the way that Jesus took for redeeming us was through the cross. That means we must also come to the cross to get our redemption. So the way he chose must be the only way to him. It's like following someone down a road, whatever road they choose is the only one we can go down go down to get to them if we're following someone. Any other road would not lead us there. It's like a, I don't know, like a car chase or something. If you get, if the car goes off to the left, you have to follow. You have to go down that same road in order to get the criminal. Um, if you go to the right road, you're not going to find them. So he is the only way. He is the truth. And this is the next bit. He's the way, the truth and life. So why is he the truth? We know that Romans and the Jews were lying about Jesus, saying he was possessed and lying to everyone and evil. Jesus didn't contest that as well, which I think is interesting, but took the punishment for us on the cross. Thus, he was telling the truth. We can also see in his miracles. It's a bit like if, if someone constantly spreads lies about us you know, over and over. If we don't rise to it or constantly protest about it, it actually makes us more credible because we know the truth. And this is why Jesus is the truth, because he said, you know, this is me, this is who I am. And the Romans and Jews were like, no, let's kill him, basically. And um, and Jesus said, you know, that's, that's, that's fine, that's my lot then, you know, and took the punishment for us. So we can tell, we know he's the truth. He also rose again as well, just like he said. So all of the prophecies about him are true. So he is the way and he is the truth. Why is he the life? Because he was willing to die. Therefore, he becomes the only channel to resurrection. He rose again, 
so we will also rise again into new life. That's what happens when we go through him for salvation. We gain life. So he's the only way, he's the only truth, and he's the only life. So I had to break that down because I love that verse. So verses 7 to 11 now. This is, this is one final claim that Jesus makes that is so clear about him being God. No one could read John and come to the conclusion that Jesus was not claiming to be God himself. It is impossible to make that assumption. And you know, I've heard a lot of people, they say that the Bible can be interpreted in infinite ways. Therefore, it's impossible to get the actual truth. Loads of people have said that to me. They said, you know, how can you follow the Bible? Because there's so many different interpretations of it. And there's so many different ways you can get to the, the truth. So what is the real truth? And I've got a real problem with that statement. Because as an example, like, if I wrote a book and I said I was five foot six, half Asian, have black hair, you know, that's, that's me. Then a hundred years later, I wouldn't expect people to think I was a seven foot Hispanic lady with green hair, for example. If it was written down and the words were tested to make sure they were correct, then there's not really many interpretations, really, that can come from the Bible. If the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. That's how I think the most important way to read the Bible is. If it's a very clear statement that lines up in context with the rest of the Bible, then it's true. We do not need to seek more interpretation. We can unpack it, we can get more from it, we can dissect it, but the main interpretation of it, the main truth, stays exactly the same from how it was written. That's why I think it's good to take the Bible quite literally sometimes. But yeah, that's just an example. And I think that, I mean, so when Jesus says here, you know, in verse 9 and 10, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. You know, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? That's what he says. I mean, it's basically just saying, like, I'm God. This is his final statement. He's made it constantly throughout. So there's not many logical conclusions that you can take from that verse without coming to the conclusion that Jesus is God. If you take any other from that, you'd have to test it with his other claims to be God throughout John. There's loads of them. The only interpretation actually holds water and is critically and logically rational is that Jesus claimed to be God. Many, in fact, all historians agree on this, that Jesus claimed to be God. They don't agree that he was God, but they do, claim, they do say that he claimed to be God. That's just fact. That's why he died. That's why the Jews killed him, because he committed blasphemy. He said that he was God, and they said, oh, you can't say that, and killed him. So that's really the main claim here throughout John, is that he's God. And if he's God, we must follow him. Sorry to go off on a tangent there, but it's very important that when we read the Bible, we let it counsel and talk to us. We should not try to interpret the Bible if the plain sense is there and widely accepted. So this is also a great verse for saying that Jesus is a, is a, isn't a different God to the one in the Old Testament, because he's not. He is the same yesterday, today and forever, as we know. And Jesus actually makes the claim he's God, therefore he is also the God in the Old Testament. So a lot of people will say, oh yeah, I remember, you know, God is really wrathful in the Old Testament and then his son Jesus comes along and sets it all straight. You know, that's not really what happened. What happened is that God and Jesus were working absolutely in tandem all throughout of human history, including the Old Testament. And then Jesus came down in, God came down in human form and took the form of Jesus. So verses 12 to, 12 to 14, we're almost there. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now this is a passage that does not need some interpretation that does sorry need some interpretation and proper study as it has been misused quite greatly especially in the modern church so the false way of seeing these verses will be to think that we have the power to perform greater miracles than Jesus and ask for whatever we want from God like a genie just kind of stick to tack on the end of the world in Jesus name and then get whatever we want that's wrong. That's what some people take this verse to mean. But if we study it in context and study it properly, it's actually much more amazing and more glorifying than that. So let's take the first misuse of the verse, greater works than I. What this means is that after Jesus' ministry finishes, so when he goes up to heaven, he will continue to save and build his church. 
He doesn't want his church cowering away and scared to do great things. He wants his church to, be, church to be preaching, to be loving, to be serving, to be shepherding the world, which is greater, really, in magnitude, but not greater as in more sensational and mind-blowing. It's greater in its magnitude. So that's when he says we will do greater things. We will build the church together and we will help convert as many people as possible, which is a great thing. The most people that came to be a Christian was, was after Jesus left. More people became Christians. And the second misuse is an interesting one. On the plain reading of this, we, the verse reads, whatever you ask for in my name, I'll do it. Without study or context, this seems like, you know, a magic word kind of verse. But let's examine it further. Jesus says, whatever you ask for in his name. That means if we ask for something that is in his will and in his purpose, then we shall have it. But if we ask for like a new car or someone to be healed that God hasn't chosen to heal, then it won't happen. Because we need to pray in his name, which really, I would say, means in his will. We know that Jesus isn't saying, you know, just pop my name on the end of the prayer and I'll get you what you want. Because that's not in his character to do that. So that's obviously the wrong interpretation of this verse. So we need to seek the right interpretation. And the right interpretation of it would be all collated throughout the Bible in context. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's flippant. It elevates us above him when we say, you know, in Jesus' name, pray for a new car. No, we pray in his name to align with his will. That's why we pray in his name. The closer we draw to him, the easier it will be to discern his will, to know his will. Therefore, our prayers will be answered with the answers we want, as our brains are wanting the same thing as God's wanting. So to put it in perspective, if, if someone was very far away from God, they might say, Lord, I pray for loads and loads of money because I want to be rich. God's probably not going to do that because that's not in his will. But the closer you get to God, you might, you might say, I want lots of money in order to feed the poor, feed the hungry, sorry, or clothe the poor or whatever. So as you get more uh, further in your walk, your will and God's will will align together. So therefore you're praying for what's actually already ordained, his purposes, you're praying for his will. So that's how to kind of properly, I believe, interpret those two verses, because they are taken wildly out of context. But yeah, interesting, that is verses 1 to 14. So the way, the truth and the life, our hope of heaven and aligning us ourselves with his will. So it's a bit of a long one today, but quite a short verse, but I thought it was just so, so useful to go through these guys. But yeah, once again, if you've got any other things you want to hear, any other things you want me to go through, um, or any feedback, give me a comment, message, or whatever, I'm always here. So um, yeah, we'll go through verses 14 onwards next time. So have a blessed week, guys, and thank you so much for tuning in.